ITW has changed what Transformers could be like. I just finished reading the series in its entirety, and I greatly enjoyed it. While there are some reasons to critique it, such as its weird crossovers, how it forgives genocidal maniacs too easily, one thing you should not critique is the existence of the relationships. The character writing in the 2005-2018 IDW series is amazing, especially in More Than Meets the Eye by James Roberts. These characters are unique, deep, and hilarious. Adding romance into the story only expanded what these robots were capable of. It gave an extra level to how much they can care for each other. It added stakes, motivations, and many juicy plot twists. I am going to name all the canon relationships and summarize them, but I'm going to label them in three different ways. Firstly, there are the fully developed relationships. These are the ones that start from nothing. These characters meet each other for the first time, they might even hate each other, but over time they become friends and then couples. These relationships are obviously the most impactful and a lot of work goes into developing them. You might have to wait 50 issues before you get an I love you, and for the poor souls who read IDW as it was coming out, you might have had to have waited years. The second type of relationship are the we're already married couples. These are the couples who when we first see them are already in their relationship. We may hear how they got together, but we don't get to see further developments. They are just there, together, already perfect or near perfect. I find these ones the most boring, but their inclusion is important because it normalizes Cybertronian marriage and romance. Not every single relationship needs to be a full love drama. The background characters don't need to take up all the panel time, and we can just enjoy them as they are. The third type I call the after the matter type. Those are the dramatic reveals, where we are introduced to two characters for a while, and only later discover that they were more than friends, or one is madly in love with the other. These ones are always juicy and add plot twists, so I appreciate them more than the second type. If you are very sensitive about spoilers, you might want to avoid this section. Now there are a few things to know about Cybertronian romance in IDW. Have you heard the term conjuncts and dura? This is the equivalent of marriage in Cybertronian culture, so I'm just going to keep saying married in the video. To become conjuncts and dura and formalize the relationship, there must be a proposal and four steps to complete the ritual called conjuncts ritus. The act of intimacy, with sustained affectional physical contact. The act of disclosure, in which the bot initiating the ritual reveals something very personal about themselves. The act of preference, in which they give a gift. And the act of devotion, in which the receiver of the proposal does something big to prove their love. It is traditional to give each other vials of their innermost energon, which is energon around their spark chamber that they were born with and doesn't get used up. They even wear the vials of their partner's energon, Sometimes this energon is offered out of respect at funerals, but giving it to another living bot culturally signifies romantic interest. Think of it like, blood of my heart. Conjux and Dura marriage is well known to Cybertronians, but is nowhere near as common as marriage for humans. It can even be embarrassing and proposals are private matters. Many Cybertronians are content with friendships and never get married. Others, such as Pipesir, are actively seeking a romantic partner. Now Cybertron is a predominantly male culture, and the result is that it is a homonormative culture. Most relationships are between two male-gendered robots. On Caminus, which has a major female-gendered population, it is also homonormative. Caminus also has another ritual for marking best friends, called Amica Endura. So as a result, straight couples in our terms are rarer. But this does not matter at all to these robots. They do not focus on gender in their relationships because romance to them has nothing to do with sexual attraction. As asexuals who do not reproduce, their romantic attachments arise whenever they grow very fond of one another. In fact, if the robots were strictly straight, that would be really, really weird. There's nothing in their DNA that drives them to prefer any gender. One day I can explain how gender works for them, but just to let you know, Cybertronians are blind to appearances and voices, many of them needing to be educated on the new gender culture because they assume even the lipstick-lipped bots are male. Now the pipe scene is actually pretty funny, but taken out of context, people will be like, oh, big chest plates, pipes likes poops, har har. That joke is for the human readers. But this pursuer of love isn't after the lady bots. I don't even think he has met one yet. When Drift recommends Tailgate, and Tailgate actually walks by, Pipes is like, <coughs> He also tells Drift that if he were shorter and turned into a boat, he would have a huge crush on him. There must be something about Tailgate that makes him very lovable, because you're about to see two more bots after his attention coming up. 
Warning, this video includes some spoilers, but I'm going to purposely be vague about plot details so that you get a great reading experience yourself. If I reveal character death, it will only be for the twist romances, because the romance is revealed after the death, so I kind of have to. But this will not be a big deal because they are the side characters. There will be plenty of surprise deaths and romantic panels I didn't show, all for your readers to discover. Chrome Dome and Rewind might as well be the cover couple of this Transformers series. They have the most panel time showcasing their affection for one another, and once their relationship is stable, they are holding hands, hugging, and saying loving things nearly every time they are seen. Even I knew of this panel before reading IDW. Chrome Dome used to be a forensic officer who worked with Prowl until he eventually became a Nemo surgeon. He specializes in reading memories, and he can even tamper with them as he inserts his claws into the subject's brain. In the past, Chrome Dome had actually married three other bots, Mac, Pivot, and Scattergun, but after each one died, the pain was so great that he would erase his memories of them. Rewind is an archivist with a video camera on his head so that he's always ready to record. They meet each other in a rather dark place. In fact, Chrome Dome is in line at a suicide clinic for bots who can't handle the war, waiting to be euthanized when he hears a scream. That is how he meets Rewind. At that time, Rewind was actually looking everywhere for his love, Dominus Ambus, who disappeared mysteriously. Rewind has resorted to looking in places where bots die, and he watches videos of executions just to know what the fate of Dominus was. Since being unintentionally saved by Rewind, they become good friends. As the two bots develop their relationship, however, Dominus becomes a conflict because Chrome Dome feels that he is the second most important bot to Rewind, and would get pushed out of the way if they ever did find his missing love. But for Rewind's sake, he puts full effort into helping him. Their relationship is explored in More Than Meets the Eye when the two board the Lost Light. You will find More Than Meets the Eye has the most developed relationships as post-war Autobots join Rodimus' crew on a big space adventure. But Chrome Dome and Rewind's relationship is not yet perfect. In fact, it is very dramatic. Chrome Dome's profession of Nemo surgery is dangerous for his health. The more he does it, the harder it is to recover from. Rewind is upset about this and makes Chrome Dome promise to stop. But Chrome Dome continuously breaks his promise each time he is called upon to investigate someone's memories. It gets worse as a huge event leaves Chrome Dome with the belief he has lost Rewind forever. He is very depressed but does not erase his memories this time, which will turn out to be a good thing when Rewind returns. Chrome Dome and Rewind take time before becoming openly affectionate, with little touching, still some arguments, and Rewind not comfortable sharing a room with him yet. They get past that and become the ship's lovebirds, so publicly affectionate that it makes Cyclonus' spark ache. Cyclonus and Tailgate Cyclonus is an agent seeker from long before the war began. However, he was on a research team who ended up being trapped in the dead universe. Because of this, Cyclonus missed the war. However much he looks like a stereotypical bad guy with devil horns, purple coloring, sharp claws, and red eyes, he's actually kind-hearted, noble, and religious. He also gets mistaken as a Decepticon and sometimes wrongly accused of crimes. Tailgate and him have something in common. They both missed the war. Tailgate was forged in Cyclonus' time, but fell through the ground and injured himself severely. He was essentially in a coma for the entire war. Tailgate and Cyclonus end up on Rodimus' ship, both feeling out of place among the Autobots. During a crisis, Rodimus commands everyone to pair up and lock themselves in their rooms, and Cyclonus notices Tailgate is stuck half-transformed. While everyone ignores him, Cyclonus takes the Minicon to a safe room. After the crisis, they keep their shared room. At the start, they are roommates, and Cyclonus is definitely not the nicest one. But over time, Cyclonus talks to him about his old life and hometown before it was all destroyed by the war. Tailgate is intrigued by him and greatly enjoys hearing Cyclonus sing religious songs in old Cybertronian. Cyclonus finds himself becoming interested in Tailgate, but he is the worst at accepting those kinds of feelings. As Tailgate tries to befriend him and include the loner in social events, Cyclonus is unnecessarily rude to push him away. But he can't ignore his attachment to Tailgate as the only one he can connect to on the ship. He and Tailgate enjoy their private conversations and old Cybertronian lessons. And Cyclonus even holds Tailgate's secrets about his past. 
Cyclonus does not want this attachment because it brings him pain, and he starts a habit of self-harm whenever he secretly feels distress. No one notices except for Whirl, who starts as his enemy then winds up his friend. Now see, what you need to know about Whirl is that he is the captain of the Cyclonus and Tailgate ship. He is the one Cyclonus eventually confides in about his feelings, and Whirl takes actions to protect their lives throughout the series. Tailgate and Cyclonus have some arguments and relationship issues, as Chrome Dome and Rewind did, but a little more dramatic. They unintentionally complete all the acts required for the Conjux and Dura proposal, and Tailgate offers him his innermost energon. First, Cyclonus does not react well to it, but he finally learns to manage his emotions and let himself fall for Tailgate. It takes a very long time, but then Cyclonus shows affection, declares his love, while World ships them in the background. Just come on! And they were roommates. Oh my god, they were roommates. But let's talk about Getaway. When you read more than meets the eye, you are going to hate this character for many reasons. Getaway manipulates Tailgate during Cyclonus and Tailgate's troubles, pretending to love him, grooming him as part of a master plan. He turns Tailgate against Cyclonus, tells him everything he wants to hear, and slyly woos him with acts of affection. It is so well planned that even Freud describes him as predatory. Getaway intends to trick Tailgate into doing something dangerous. Whirl hears this and warns Cyclonus, who goes into overdrive and rushes to Tailgate's aid. After that, Cyclonus is worried about Tailgate being manipulated by others again, causing a very realistic argument. Everything works out, and Getaway is revealed to be the devil that he is. Drift and Ratchet Ratchet is the old, cranky Autobot chief doctor. He's easily annoyed, proudly atheist, and does not want to put up with any bullshit. Drift is a cherry Autobot sword wielder, spiritual and whimsical. Drift wasn't always like this, however. In the past, he was a homeless Cybertronian drug addict, stealing Energon to survive. He met Ratchet as the doctor was saving him from a drug overdose, and afterward, Ratchet then told him to get a job and do better in life. While well, not long after that, Drift winded up a Decepticon of a natural talent for killing. Drift is known as Deadlock and is a well-known Decepticon until he finds a perfect society and has a coming to Jesus moment. Drift is truly good now and very kind, someone that Ronimus trusts. He and Drift's relationship develops beyond the scenes for a good chunk of Mortem ECI. First they go on a mission to Delphi, but nothing particularly romantic stands out there. The two simply hang out a lot and is hinted at when Drift mentions spending time with Ratchet. Drift is able to get away with harsh jokes of Ratchet, and he also accidentally slips out his nicknames for Ratchet in conversations. He seems to find Ratchet quite likable despite his grouchy attitude, in fact it may be that his grouchiness is endearing. After all, he knows it isn't mean-spirited because Ratchet is secretly a caring soul. Drift's adoration for Ratchet starts becoming clear when he tells the story of how Ratchet saved his life in the past, with a special focus on Ratchet. But you really know this is more than friendship, when Drift is unfairly exiled from the ship. As the crowd beats on Drift and knocks him down, Ratchet is the one who helps him up. After Drift's exile, Ratchet accuses Rodimus of being too hard on Drift, especially when he was less punishing of other crewmates' actions. In the end, Ratchet goes on a solo quest to bring Drift back home. He also acquires a little Drift figurine for the trip, so you know that his ass is in love. At some point on the way back, it is likely the two do the marriage ritual, and Drift colors himself for the occasion. It is confirmed later that Ratchet and Drift are Conjux and Dura. This relationship has a Rodimus stamp of approval. We also joke in the fandom that Ratchet is very lucky because... Damn boy, he fit, boy! In the Anya Cybertron stories, we get two more developed from nothing relationships. Lightbright and Sparkstalker is a relationship that is barely shown, more of a background development. Sparkstalker is a destructive Decepticon Firecon who went to Kaminus to help clear rubble and rescue people after an attack. There he met a Camion named Lightbright. You can see them together flirting with each other in a bar scene, and in the holiday special, Sparkstalker asks her to marry him. After this, the couple can be briefly seen in other issues. Near the end of the series, we get RC and Aileron. RC has led a tough life. She was an old warrior gendered male, but found that she did not like that identity. Giaxus was meant to help her modify her body to help her dysphoria, but made her into a berserker. RC is a violent warrior and even acted as an assassin, 
but now she's calmed down and tried to be a good Autobot. RC befriends a Camion named Aileron. Aileron was a Camion raised to worship the Primes, but after working with Optimus, loses her faith in him. She and RC are able to share their woes and get close. Aileron comforts RC when she is particularly saddened after her death. Later, after doing battle and after Aileron saves RC's life, it turns out that they find themselves quite in love. RC and Aileron passionately kiss three times at least in the climax. RC's new love for someone else motivates her to help save the universe. Next, I will point out relationships that are already established when you are introduced to the characters. Anode and Lug, like RC, used to be gendered male but found they wanted a change that better suited them. Anode and Lug are Cybertronian but traveled out into the universe on many adventures. Lug basically transforms into a girlfriend backpack. For a while, Anode stayed on the Caminus and studied to be a blacksmith, which means someone who helps malfunctioning protoforms find their shape and come to life. After a terrible failure, Anode flees the planet from shame and returns to Lug. Anode keeps her own failure a secret, which gives Lug the impression that Anode only left her profession for her sake. Anode finally reveals her secret, which goes over very well. The two are very openly affectionate like Rewind and Chrome Dome, making them another cover couple for IDW. However, since they are introduced in Lost Light, which is near the end of the series, they do not have much panel time. They stood out while they lasted, but we don't actually get to see the backstory of how they met. Knockout and Breakdown, although they look like their Transformers Prime counterparts, are here an IDW married couple. They're both Philocitronians, from a colony world obsessed with speed. Unfortunately for Breakdown, he is slow and therefore a social outcast. Knockout does not seem to mind this and loves him anyway. We do not have much else for backstory and there is no explicit scenes of affection, but the two do take a vacation in the holiday special. Tigatron and Air Razor are both Eukaryans, peace formers of a colony world, but on their world, their species types are divided into tribes. Despite belonging to rival tribes, these two found forbidden love much like two cats of different clans in the famous Warrior series. Because of their love, they are outcasts and now belong to no tribe. However, they are enough for each other and are verbally affectionate with their love. The two are inseparable and they fight together. Ramaj and Rekgar were the rulers of the destroyed planet Junkion, Matriarch and Patriarch. The two are in love, but Rekgar is the most affectionate, very verbally gushy and often professing his love for her. Even when he is reduced to a head, Ramesh carries him everywhere and he's still super loving and talkative. Greenlight and Lancer are two Carcer colonists. We encounter them on guard duty together, a very hands-on couple. We don't know much about them at all, and the scenes with them are very few. The two go out for a drink at some point and are offended by a drunkard's terrible attempt to talk to them. Greenlight and Lancer seem to always be together. Dustup and Jumpstream are a couple you can accidentally miss. Both are Camion, Conjax, and Dury, who became Torchbearers, a group of peacekeepers that serve the Mistress of Flame. They are not openly romantic in the comics, so you have to pay attention to know that they are more than friends and fellow components of Victorion, a combiner. The last few are ones whose love is revealed dramatically. These include two characters who you didn't know how to think for each other until later. They don't have much backstory or development either, but their inclusion is very interesting for the plot. Also, since two of these are Decepticon couples, their existence adds another layer to what Decepticons can be. While strongly opposed to the Autobots, they can be very close to each other and share the same goals. It gives Decepticons motivation to fight harder, and it gives them a reason to be angry when one of them dies. Onslaught and Blastoff are an interesting pair. These Combaticons fought together for a long time, but Blastoff grew secretly infatuated with his commander Onslaught. He jokes about wanting to kill him and taking over, but the two know Blastoff is actually very loyal to him. Onslaught appreciates his work, but originally does not notice Blastoff's crush because he is too busy hating Autobots. After the Constructicons find themselves in a coma and enemies of Starscream, Starscream hires a Nemo surgeon named Arachnid to tamper with their memories so that they forget to hate him. Something about being a combiner links their minds and creates the false memories, but the one they enter apparently is going to remember the procedure. Starscream picks Blastoff and hopes to sway him into making a deal. To see what Blastoff wants so they can influence him, Arachnid uses his memories to construct his perfect life. This is very cool because what do you imagine a Decepticon's dream life would be? Standing on a pile of bodies in a world on fire? 
No, instead Blastoff dreams that he and Onslaught are a couple sharing an apartment and bed. Caught, Blastoff is quite embarrassed that Starscream saw his fantasy. Starscream tells him that he can make it happen, that he can tamper with Onslaught. Blastoff strongly refuses, but Starscream says that if they don't tamper with their memories at all, they might remain comatose or locked up in prison forever. If they escape, Onslaught's hatred against the Autobots will mean that one day he will go too far and get killed. Blastoff really doesn't want that to happen, and that had already been a concern he had had. He knows Onslaught is too fixated on vengeance. Starscream says that they don't have to force Onslaught to love him, but they can make him notice him. And that is exactly what happens. Blastoff wakes from the coma first, and Onslaught wakes up and catches him looking at him. Onslaught's realization was that Blastoff had always been watching him like that, and as it turns out, Onslaught likes it. He accepts Blastoff's love and holds his hand, although Blastoff won't let Starscream see it and be smug. The two then become close now that Onslaught is calm and lost his drive for revenge. They end up moving in together in an apartment and are said to have planned a formal date. Starscream gloats on his success, but Blastoff is still very frustrated that he has to hide the deleted memories from the rest of the Constructicons. The next is not a couple, but a one-sided crush that Brainstorm has for Quark. He really really loved his fellow scientist colleague, but he was never able to confess before Quark died in the war. Poor Brainstorm had a deal with that. When Rodimus' crew arrives on a planet that tries to make them happy by showing them their dream life, Quark appears for Brainstorm just like Onslaught in Blastoff's dream. Brainstorm's version of Quark declares that he loves him just as much as he does and proposes to him. The final canon pairing is another juicy Decepticon reveal. When you first meet Needlenose and Horrible, they just seem like two Decepticon troublemakers. Right after the Autobots win the war, they decide to control the Decepticons by planting explosives in their head to force them to behave. Extreme, I know. But Rowdy Horrible winds up losing his head right next to Needlenose. And having that happen to a friend is tragic enough, so we already understand why Needlenose becomes very focal against the Autobots. But then bam, we get Needlenose shouting that he had actually been in love with Horrible. The two had been a couple, and Needlenose is very agitated about the whole ordeal. Out of anger, he yells out a few times that they killed the bot he loved, and he even reveals later that the reason he joined the Decepticons was out of love for Horrible. We do eventually get a little backstory that I find absolutely juicy. See, Needle Nose has a twin brother named Trax. Siblings occur now and then among Cybertron and Sparks, but it has nothing to do with sexual reproduction. Now one brother is destined to become an Autobot, the other a Decepticon. Trax and Needlenose, before the war, are privileged as flyers in a society that values you based on what you transform into. Needlenose was more affected by the revolution and wanted to support the less fortunate, and so him falling for a beast former may have actually been scandalous at the time. When Needlenose starts sneaking off with his revolutionary friend, Trax is highly opposed to it, but Needlenose elopes with this horrible, getting into revolutionary activities like arm stealing. Needlenose and Horrible are never openly affectionate, but others have referred to them as boyfriends. This reminds me of the plot of a teenage novel with Needlenose sneaking out of the house and hanging out with the bad boy he shouldn't be with. Trax and Needlenose lose their connection, and occasionally, Trax is poked at for having a Decepticon brother. But he claims that he does not hate his brother, likely because he pities him. Their brotherly relationship is actually complicated and highly enjoyable, just as important as the romantic relationships we see. Although Needlenose suffered the loss of his partner, in the end, he and his brother reconnect and are friends once again. But now I can hardly recognize her. Savannah associates with gang members. Savannah's snuck out of the house over 20 times. The parties, spend the night with friends, boyfriend, drinking, smoke pot, anything, you name it. Now, if I missed a couple, it might have been one of those background couples and I'm very sorry. But these ones are very cool and I wanted to share them for the people who don't know much about the IDW 2005-2018 to comics. I kept out enough details so that you have a lot to experience if you go for the comics yourself. I hope this encouraged people to give the comics a chance, maybe searching for more of these wonderful relationships. 
And the thing about having romantic Transformers is that we can't be sure how deep the emotions characters have for each other are. You are free to speculate if there was more going on than there seemed. Do you think Starscream's attachment to Wheeljack and inability to lie to him and only him had any special explanation? That is the fun you can have with IDW. It can be hard to figure out when a Transformers friendship is growing into something stronger and more affectionate. So ship away, my friends.